Hi everyone, this is your host and your coach, Mary Ayers, and welcome to part three of How to Move Forward When You're Stuck in Fear. You know, over the past couple of weeks, we've been discovering ways to go from feelings of being swallowed up in confusion or apathy or laid up with the blues, anything that you know that you do that just kind of keeps you down, to getting ourselves to take action. And each week we've looked at where we may be stuck and how to use tapping to clear those blocks. Well, today we're going to be looking at how the questions we ask either give us energy or drain our energy away. Now, I know some of you are probably pretty surprised by that because you don't think about the questions you're asking. And I know that because most people aren't even aware that thinking is done in questions. And by the way, if you are wondering about that right now, you are saying to yourself, is that really true? Which you'll just notice is a question that you have asked. So, We say that thinking is done in questions, even though you may not be aware that you are asking yourself questions because they they flash across the back of your mind so quickly that you're not even aware that you are answering those questions, that you have had a question asked that is causing you to answer it. It is also, as you will see, causing you to focus in a particular way, and that's why we want to be aware of the questions we're asking. So let me show you how our questions determine what we focus on. On the other side of that coin would be our questions also then determine what we are deleting from our environment. So we're going to do a little bit of an exercise. And if you're driving right now, please do not do this. You can do it when you get back home. It's a great exercise and you can do it no matter where you are. Take a second and look around the room and look for brown. What in your room is brown? Look anywhere you want, up back behind you, below you, no matter what, look for brown. What in your room is brown? Now close your eyes. Keeping your eyes closed, what in the room is red? Now, I don't have to be in your room to know that you may have remembered maybe one or two things, but if you open your eyes now and look around, I know that you will start to find more red. This is a small example of how our mind works. I gave you the question, what in the room is brown? And what your mind did is it pulled all those things that are brown up closer. In other words, they brought it closer to your awareness. And everything that wasn't brown went to the background because it wasn't needed. Now, I like using brown because brown's a lot like BS. So in other words, our lenses start to get filtered around things that are brown, and again, I'm using brown as that idea of, you know, the the junk in our life, but there's a reason for this, is that because somehow we have identified those brown things as being things that will keep us safe, things that we need to pay attention to so that we can have safety, mostly an environmental safety. There was a time when we lived in caves that we needed to have an awareness of our surroundings. You needed to be able to look for sounds and sights and subtle changes, maybe a branch broken, to be able to tell an animal was near. Now, we don't have that kind of physical danger, although we are aware of things like that. If we live in a city, you're walking down streets, you have a filter that's going on around you, looking for things around you keeping you safe. If you live in Colorado where I do, when I go hiking, I have a heightened sense of what is around me because we have animals where I live and it's, it is self-preservation to keep my eyes open and looking for clues, looking for things that might be around me to keep myself safe. But for the most part, outside of our physical safety, the other thing that we're using our lens for is what we call emotional safety, right? Things that would potentially lead to embarrassment, humiliation, anger, feeling threatened, feeling um, abandoned, feeling rejected, feeling inadequate. All those feelings, I mean, we have a list of things we do not want to feel. And since we have some experience in our past that has told us, I felt this way before, it didn't feel good, whatever I need to do, I need to avoid feeling that way again. And so my, my filters, a term I know you've heard, have been defined by looking for things that potentially, and I use the word potentially because we are just keeping an eye on it, that vigilance potentially could cause us to have any of those emotions that we no longer want to have. 
So we develop these filters that help us learn what to look for so that we can, in fact, keep ourselves safe. Now keep in mind also that the filters that we are developing are not just to keep ourselves safe, but we're also viewing other people through those filters. So we're looking at their actions, things that they are doing, things that they're saying, and we are labeling their actions or even that person as a whole as they are dangerous, they are a threat, they can hurt me. And while that may be true that you may need to have, be a little bit more aware, sometimes these filters can really jump the gun. In other words, somebody may do something sort of like something that reminds you of something else. And all of a sudden, we will throw up our guard and we may get that emotional hijack that I've talked about before in the other recordings. We may get emotionally hijacked because in that moment, we believe somebody is doing or saying something that could potentially harm us, and yet we don't really know that. In other words, because we are being hijacked, we're not able to look at that situation from a neutral standpoint. Until we can do that, we can do that by the tapping, but until we can do that, we are really basically projecting on somebody something in a way of keeping us safe. I have given this exercise to couples, to individuals, as long as I've been in practice, well over 26 years, because it is such a great exercise to show us, to make known to us our lens. Because a lot of times, you know, we want to change something, but we're not sure what to change because we can't see it. A lot of this is happening at the subconscious level. And at the subconscious level, as we know, we don't know that we're doing it. It's a pattern behavior. It's a pattern response. And so when we start to notice, then we have more control over about what we can change. Now, before anybody gets too excited about all of that, you will never be able to see everything in your subconscious, every single pattern you have or know everywhere you got it. But one of the things I really do love about the tapping is is that it helps us to work with the beliefs that we do have, the ones that we are aware of. And these kinds of exercises and the questions that we ask can help us to uncover even more of the subconscious. But know that you will never get to all of it. 90% of us is probably at the unconscious level for good reason. We don't need to have an awareness of all of this. It is helpful for us to have an awareness of the stuff that holds us back, though, because we want to be in action. I've often likened the idea of questions being a lot like a Google search, and everybody knows this, is that you can put any question into a Google search and you will get thousands, perhaps millions, of answers. And yet, just because you come up with a lot of answers doesn't mean that you are getting good information. It has to do with the question that you put into Google. If you put in a high-quality question, one that defines things in a way that will give you the information that you want, then we were going to get information back from that question, that query that's going to be helpful to us. If I put in a bad question, a non-defined question, something too global, um, then I'm going to get answers that really might have much use, don't have much information. They're not going to help me in my query. So the quality of the questions that you ask will definitely determine the material that you get. And you can ask a poor quality question and hence get bad information back, and I'm going to illustrate that to you in a second, or you can ask a high-quality question, and and then you'll get information back that will be very helpful. And at the end of this program, we're going to look at those kinds of questions. So what kind of questions do we ask ourselves that drain our energy? Well, I'm going to offer you some, and I know that you are going to be familiar with these. We ask things like, you know, why can't I get going? Or what's wrong with me? Why am I stuck? Why can't I figure this out? Why can't I get moving? Why doesn't anything work for me? Why can't I meet someone? Why can't I lose the weight? Now, on one hand, you may think that these are great questions because you are exploring. I need to have the origin of the problem. I need to find the root of the problem because there's a belief that goes here that says, if I can find the root of the problem, I can fix it. And if I can fix it, then I no longer have the problem. It's a very mechanistic way of thinking. Now, that works if you're in a car, 
right? My, I go out there, my car doesn't work, it, it doesn't turn over, it goes, mate, 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 mate. And we go, all right, now let me get an idea of what the problem is. Because if I can sort out the problem, my battery's dead, then I can go get my battery charged, I may have to replace my battery, but as soon as I do, I put the battery back in, and boom, I'm on my way, and I'm going again. That is the kind of research or process that one would take for a more mechanical problem. But we are not mechanics. We are human beings. And so to ask ourselves, why am I not doing something, implies that there is a one source type of of answer for that. That If I could just figure out that one thing that keeps me from taking action, whatever my problem is, then I can fix it. And what we'll find are that people spend so much time trying to get to the root of something when the truth is, here's the problem with why questions. They imply single causality, but that is not necessarily true. So in some ways, sometimes, why questions are not helpful. They're asking for a search. It's like that bad Google search I mentioned earlier. They're asking for a search that really isn't a helpful question. Some of these other kinds of questions that we ask ourselves really drain our energy. For instance, you know, what's wrong with me? Now, again, from the standpoint of somebody who's saying, you know, yes, but that's what I need to do. I need to explore that kind of question so I can figure it out. And then if I figure it out, I'll fix it. It's been a question I've had all my life. But here's why that is an energy draining question is because within that question, there's something we call a presupposition. And a presupposition is something that we already believe is true. It's already in the question, but we never question the question to see if it is right or wrong. For instance, what's wrong with me implies something is wrong with me, and I need to figure out what it is. So when we ask these questions, we don't ask, well, wait a minute, is there something really wrong with me? If we go back to that, instead of just saying, well, what's wrong with me? Hmm, i got to figure it out. See, we haven't questioned the question. I've often said, it's like, remember in math, you'd write down the problem out of the book, and you would come up with an answer, and you would get back from the teacher, and a big red cross on it says, it's wrong. You've done this wrong. And you're looking at that problem, and you're adding it back up, and you think to yourself, no, this is the right answer. I have the correct answer to this problem. And you take it up to the teacher and you say to her, hey, what's going on here? I got this right. Why did you mark it wrong? And she looks at you and she says, oh, you did. You got the right answer to that problem. However, you wrote the problem wrong. You wrote the numbers wrong. So hence, it's not the the problem from the book. You didn't answer the problem from the book. You did get the right answer, though. So... My point of this is is that you may be looking for an answer for something that is not the right question to be asking. What's wrong with me? How come I'm so stupid? Implies I'm stupid. Now I'm trying to figure out how come I'm so stupid. Why doesn't anybody love me? Presupposition in that is that nobody loves me. I'm unlovable. Now I'm trying to figure out why that is. These are endless loop questions. Because really, come on. What's wrong with me? You could go forever, an entire lifetime, and believe me, people do. I've had people, I've been in therapy for years and years and years trying to figure it out. And I go, well, you know what? It's because you're looking to uh, for an answer to a poor question of what's wrong with me. And now you're trying to figure it out. And you've gone all kinds of answers over the years. You've signed up for one more program. You've taken one more step to figure it out. But guess what? You would, No matter what you did, you'd still find yourself asking that question. And your mind says, well, it must be something else. It must be something else. And I've got to get to the bottom of it in order for me to fix it. Well, we're challenging that. And I know this is hard for people because they really believe, well, that's not true. If I could really figure it out, then I'd be able to fix it. So here's what I want to do, because I'm not going to convince you. I know I may have gotten your curiosity up, and maybe I hope to have got a little bit of a knack of questioning in there for you, just enough curiosity for you to continue to listen and at least leave your mind open from this. Because the idea that you don't have to fix your problems 
is one that you're going to resist. And by the way, I'm not saying we don't fix our problems. What I am saying is that when we adjust our questions, we will have a new direction to go in and that our new direction may move us along further so that we can get into action. And then on top of it, we can ask better quality questions, ones that will really draw from our resources, that will draw from our strengths. Here's how we're going to start this process. Think of a question that you ask on a frequent basis. And maybe let's, I'm going to take one, like, why can't I figure things out? And take that question and then make it into a statement. So for why can't I figure things out, the statement becomes, I can't figure things out. If it was, what's wrong with me? The statement is, something's wrong with me. Now, if we take it an extra step, we would actually go to the belief behind that. So for our question, why can't I figure it out, it becomes the statement, I can't figure things out, which becomes the belief, there's something wrong with me. So that's how we find those core beliefs. We take our question, we make it a statement, and then we look at the belief behind it, which must be, there's something wrong with me. That's why I can't figure things out. And then we try and spend our time trying to learn what it is. But here's the irony in that. You have a belief that you can't figure things out, which is more dominant than the idea that you can figure it out. So you're almost canceling out the thought every single time. And I hope you're following this because you may have to listen to this a couple of times because sometimes it feels like I'm saying double talk. I'm saying the statement and then I go back and I go, wait a minute, my question isn't in line with that. I'm I'm all mixed up. And you're right. It is mind-boggling. This is why we get so spinning our wheels. This is why we sit still like deer in the headlights. We're going, I don't know where to begin. I don't know how to go about this. And it's because we're asking a question that already has a built-in break. It's almost like the emergency break is set. There's no way you can figure out if your belief is, I can't figure it out or I'm not smart enough to figure it out. And you're trying to figure it out. Remember the example I always give to somebody is is that a lot of times I'll have people will give me a call and say, I want you to work with me on my procrastination. I am a procrastinator. And they want to change that. And I say, well, you know, part of what you're going to work with is letting go of the identity, I am a procrastinator. Because as long as you are absolutely sure that you are a procrastinator, then anytime you finish a project or you complete a project, you will consider it the exception. It's an exception to the rule that you are a procrastinator. What really needs to change is our identity, and that's what we're going to be talking about a little bit on this with questions, but even more so on our Part 4 class. Because when you are a completer, when you see yourself as being a completer, completers procrastinate sometimes, but it's the exception. When you see yourself as a procrastinator, completing is the exception. So see, we always have periods of times where we break our rules, but it's the way we say it to ourselves. Is it congruent with our identity that I am figuring it out, or is it incongruent with our identity that I can't figure things out? So this is why questions are another reason why they're so important. But let's do some tapping on this, this question that we have of why can't I figure things out. If that's your question and you can relate to that, See the strength of it. You know, why can't I figure things out? I can't figure things out. Something must be wrong with me. Get to that, feel it. How true does that feel to you? I know you're not going to like to own it, but let's be real. This is how we get past these things. We have to own it for a little bit until we're changing it. Scale of 0 to 10, how true does that feel to you? Where do you feel it? And we're going to start on the karate chop. Even though I have this conviction... That something is wrong with me. I choose to accept myself anyhow. Even though I just know something's wrong with me. Because I can never figure it out. I choose to know that I can change this. Even though I have this problem, something's wrong with me. There's nothing I can do about it. I choose to be open to a new way of seeing this. And at the eyebrow, I have this conviction. 
side of the eye. I know something's wrong with me under the neath the eye, and I have to figure it out under the nose. I need to fix it on the chin, but I don't know what it is. Collarbone. I know something's wrong with me under the arm, but I can't figure it out. Top of the head. Something's wrong with me, and I need to fix it. Back at the eyebrow. What if that's not true? Side of the eye. But I know it is. Underneath the eye. There is something wrong with me. Under the nose. Because I'm not doing the things I need to do. On the chin. That must mean something's wrong with me. Collarbone. And if I could just figure it out. Underneath the arm then my life would really change. Top of the head. Everything would be different. Back at the eyebrow. That's my belief. Side of the eye. But I'm choosing to challenge it now. Underneath the eye. What if there's nothing wrong with me? Under the nose. What if this is a bad question? Collarbone. Perhaps I can ask a better question on the collarbone. One that would show my strengths under the arm. One with it that would help me get into action. Top of the head. I'm choosing to find a better question. Back at the eyebrow. Maybe nothing's wrong with me. Side of the eye. Maybe it was just about learning under the eye how to ask a better question. Under the nose, I'm choosing to find a better question on the chin. And when I do, collarbone, I know that I can find some strengths under the arm because I've gotten through tough times before, top of the head. And I know I have the ability to do it again and take a breath. Now, ask yourself again, something's wrong with me, and just feel the strength of that. Does it feel a little less, a little less gravity? Does it feel a little softer? And by the way, all the questions I'm asking right now are questions that help us look towards change, towards something that is different, towards possibility. And those are the kind of questions that we want, are things that start to lead us into a a space of more choice, more possibility. Because if you can take the small step and you can take more of those, you start moving into an area of feeling capable, of confidence, because of the questions that you're asking, because you're choosing to focus and bring into your sight possibilities that have already existed, things that you have already done, times where you have already been strong, where you have already figured out the resources that you've had and you've taken steps, areas where you've already started to build confidence, even if you're not 100% there right now. The point is is that you are beginning to get there and the questions you ask are either going to keep you on your path or they will put you in a maze where you get stuck. Okay, so let's find another place to tap because I'm telling you, I know where these little the little hiccups are, our little places where we go, yes, but I need to know why. This is a biggie for people. We have been raised in an environment that has said to us, you know, you need to know why. You, you have to figure it out. Our parents say it. I see it all the time. It's, it is hysterical to me as I'll see people, parents say to their kids, it's one, one's crying and the other one's standing there with a the look on their face and their parents will say to them, you know, why did you hit your sister? And I think, because she was bothering me. But it's not an okay answer because you're still going to get in trouble when we figure it out. That's not a good enough answer. We got questions like, why, did you, why didn't you do better in school? Or why did you say that? Or why did you touch that? Or why can't you be more like somebody else? When we heard those questions, 
what we learned was that to ask that question, that there must have been an answer. And if I can just figure out the answer, then I will get it right and my parent will be pleased and I won't be in trouble. And so we learned early on to ask these these why questions. And now we believe that we have to. And here I am telling you, don't get stuck in the whys. It's not going to help you right now. So the first thing we want to do is tap on my need and my my rebellion about, I do have to know why, Mary. Doggone it. I won't be able to fix anything if I don't know why. So while I've got you all riled up, let's get on that karate chop spot, shall we? Even though I have to know why. I have to get to the bottom of it. I have to figure out what's wrong with me. I choose to accept myself now, even though I'm asking these questions. Even though it's a must for me to know why. I've been searching forever. I can't stop now. I choose to know it's possible for me to be okay now. Even though I'm not okay right now because I don't know why. And I need to know why. I need those answers. I need to fix me. I'm open to the possibility that there's nothing wrong with me and that if I could ask a new question, I could discover my strengths, my resources, my gifts, and I could offer them to myself and the world. At the eyebrow, I have to know why. Side of the eye, they said I should know why. Under the eye, I got in trouble if I didn't know why. Under the nose, if I can just figure out why I am the way I am. On the chin, then I know I could fix it. Collarbone, I know I could find somebody else to fix me. Under the arm, then I would be fixable. Top of the head, then they would love me. Back at the eyebrow, then they would have stayed with me side of the eye then I could get them back under the eye then they would accept me underneath the nose so I have to know why on the chin or I'll lose them forever on the collarbone but I wonder if it's possible under the arm for me to entertain the idea top of the head that there is nothing wrong back of the eyebrow maybe there is nothing wrong with me side of the eye that doesn't mean I did everything right underneath the eye but that doesn't make me wrong under the nose my actions may have not have been great on the chin but I can learn to change that collarbone I might have said something that wasn't so great under the arm but I can choose again on what I say top of the head those are behaviors back at the eyebrow and everybody screws up sometimes side of the eye That doesn't make something wrong with me. Under the eye. After all, a child may make a mistake. Under the nose. But that doesn't make them wrong. On the chin. They can learn. On the collarbone. They do plenty of things right. Under the arm. I choose to change this question. Top of the head. I choose to know that I am not my actions. Back at the eyebrow. I can change my questions. Side of the eye. Without knowing why. Under the eye. 
just for life to be better under the nose that's reason enough on the chin to start asking better questions collarbones questions that allow me to appreciate myself under the arm questions that allow me to grow top of the head questions that allow me flexibility and forgiveness take a breath now feel the sense of I need to know why you probably will have to tap on this again because again we heard it so many times and the questions are kind of slippery you know we don't know what we're asking ourselves it's one of the things when I'm coaching with somebody I'm so aware of the questions that they're asking and I can hear it but I know that if I threw them all back at them right then and there they would they wouldn't know what I was talking about because they they're not aware of the questions they're asking so here's your call to action this week we're going to look at what are some questions that we want to ask instead what is a good quality question so let me throw some of these at you and you can listen to these again write them down and if actually I have got a list of some really good questions so you may email me at mary at tapintoaction.com and ask for that list of why questions good healthy why questions and some other questions and I would be happy to send it to you so just get a hold of me, Mary, at tapintoaction.com and, and ask for the why list. But here's an idea of some different kinds of questions. So you can ask how questions. How can I move now? How does it feel to feel good? What makes me smile? What was the last thing I laughed at? What if I could? What if I'm already starting to do it? What would I notice? What if I noticed more of that? How would that feel? What difference would that make? What would I be telling myself when I'm noticing that things are changing? How am I feeling better? Do you hear the quality in those questions? Do you see how they ask for us to focus on a way where change is taking place, where our energy is, where it has been, what does it feel like? Where do I feel it in my body? How would I smile when I'm feeling good? What would I notice that would tell me change is starting to take place, that I am feeling better, that I am noticing these small changes, that I have found some new strategies, that I am seeing myself in a different light? I love questions, and there's no problem with asking questions. It's the quality of the question that we want to really embrace more and start to ask better questions. So here's another part of your call to action. Think about the things you say to yourself all day, the questions you ask. And again, we're asking you to notice because questions, they happen so quickly in our mind that we're not always aware of them. Write a couple of them down. This is only two minutes. This is not an hour and a half kind of homework. This is the field work for you just to become aware. Then think about it from the question to the statement and then from the statement to the belief think about what we said before if I'm saying why can't I get this right the statement is I don't get I can't get anything right and then the belief is you know I'm stupid that's why I can't get anything right you may find that you become aware of where did you learn that I know for me growing up my mom used to always say you know I don't know what's wrong with you and I know now as an adult she wasn't saying that to lay something heavy on me but what she didn't know is that as a child I heard that as something is wrong with you we don't know what it is you need to figure it out and I laugh because I go, hey, I ended up becoming a therapist and trying to spend my whole life trying to figure it out. These things people say to us leave an impact. They leave a mark on us. And I just want to be able to look at it. Where did I learn that? And you may need to go back and tap on that specific event where somebody said that to you. That's good work. That is really good work. Then begin to write a belief that you would like to have. We want to be able to know what do you want to replace that with. Now, saying, you know, just there's nothing wrong with me may or may not be the answer. But play with what kind of beliefs you want to own. Which ones do you want to condition in? Because on our next show, I'm going to show you how to start conditioning those beliefs into the body so that they become 
who part of who you are, part of your identity. You're always going to ask questions. We just want to ask better questions. We want ones that create an identity of strength and resourcefulness and resiliency and brilliance and creativity and purpose. That's who we are, but our questions need to bring that part out. Well, this has been a great week. I hope you you know this might be one that you need to go back and listen to again, and that's okay. There's a lot of information in this small little class. So until next time, feel free to email me at mary at tapintoaction.com. Let me know your thoughts, what's been helpful, and until next time, 